be turning, if you will, to the 23rd division of the book of Psalms, that is Psalms 23. When you get there, you should immediately recognize that the 23rd division of Psalms is the most famous piece of literature known to man. This 23rd division of the book of Psalms. This Psalms is the most well-known paragraph from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21. This 23rd division of the book of Psalms, one of the very first narratives, chapters, verse that we were required to memorize was the 23rd division of the book of Psalms. This Psalms, it fits and outfits us more than any passage of scripture in all of the Bible. The 23rd division of the book of Psalms. It is more prevalent in everything that we do. Perhaps there are those that are sitting here as well as I can remember sitting on mother's knee. She would always read to us the 23rd division of the book of Psalms. Even entering <coughs> elementary school, one of the very first assignments that we would have, I know that's long gone now, but one of the very first assignments that we were given were to memorize the 23rd division of the book of Psalms. Even in high school, in our literature books, you can find the 23rd division of the book of Psalms. This Psalms is more active in our everyday lives. When I do my invitations and I do my my visitations and all of the work that I do, hospitals, nursing homes, head starts, <coughs> sick, shed ins. I would always ask this question before we have prayer. Is there some passage of scripture that I can read to you? that will bring just a little bit more comfort, a more deeper, more abiding faith to help get you through the day. More often than not, I've been told to read to me the 23rd division of the book of Psalms. Even during funerals, you will hear this narrative more than you hear Job 14, 1 to 14. John 14, 1 to 6, 2 Corinthians 5, you will hear the 23rd division of the book of Psalms. This Psalms has been read in Head Start, kindergartens, nursery schools, but it's also been read on the battlefield during wartime. This Psalms have been read to our children doing VBS who can understand it. But this Psalms is also baffled scholars. This Psalms is shallow enough for a little one to wade in. But yet it's deep enough for an elephant to swim in. This 23rd division of the book of Psalms the very first thing that it shows each of us that we have all the assistance that we need to make it to heaven. Notice verse number one. In verse number one, that passage says that the Lord is my shepherd. Now here we have in Psalms 23, Verse number one, the Lord is my shepherd. We have in that particular sequence somebody out in front of us that are leading us. 
But then notice verse number six. Now in verse number six, just in those 25 words, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. You might want to ask the question, how long? All the days, not just on this time side of life, but all the days of my life. Because then you can go on and on and live with God in heaven. So now we have somebody behind us. And what do we have? We have his goodness and his mercy. That's following us. But the longest verse is in verse number four. But in verse number four, where well you have those 30 words there. Notice what it says. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me. Then it tells us some about thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. So now I have something on the side of me. I have his rod and I have his staff. All of this help out front. All of this help behind. All of this help on the side. If I don't make it to heaven, it is nobody's fault but my own. Now for our Next 55 minutes, just to be <laughs> consistent with what the preacher says, yes, <laughs> I want to look at the first nine words in verse number one. One period, one semicolon, where it says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now with those nine verses, this is what we need to do and try to develop this morning. I want to look at three points there. Point number one, and just for a memory tool, I'll give you the alphabet G and the alphabet S. First of all, I want to look at the glory of sovereign. The glorious sovereign. Then secondly, I want to look at the gentle shepherd. The gentle shepherd. And if time would allow, point number three, we'll look at the sufficient supply. <clears throat> the endless supply. Now notice something here. If we're going to obtain the Lord as our shepherd, you're going to have to know the glory of sovereign. David said, the Lord. Stop right there. When David penned this psalm, notice what he says. The Lord. That is the glorious sovereign. How amazing it is that David used what we call the tetragrammaton. That's Y-H-W-H. And certainly start from right to left. This is God's most a holy name. Why is it David didn't say that the Canaanites and all of their idolatry, they have a false God for every day of their calendar year? Beginning with Baal, the Zidonians, the worshiping of Baal. David didn't say, that's my shepherd. David says, the Lord. When David penned this song, the Egyptians had in excess of 
thousand idol gods. But David says, the Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. The Philistines, their chief idol god was that half man, half fish that's called Dagon. But David didn't acknowledge that. David says that the Lord is my shepherd. What about the Babylonian idol gods, Marduk and Nebo? David didn't use those. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. What about the Ammonites worshiping uh, Milcom? Or the Moabites worshiping Chemosh? But David says, the Lord is my shepherd. If we're going to know the glorious sovereign, if we're going to know that God Almighty is out in front of us leading us, then we're going to have to know the glorious sovereign. That is the Lord is my shepherd. Notice something else that David does. Because when David penned this song, and David used the word Yahweh, that's my shepherd. How interesting it is. When a Jewish scribe come across this word, he would lay down his pen. He would take off his clothes. He would take a bath. He would put on some new clothes. Grab a new pen. And he would write the word Yahweh. Then he would break that pen. Take off those clothes. Take another bath. Put on those old clothes. Pick back that old pen up and he will continue his writing because Yahweh is the most sacred name. This name was used only one time a year. This name was used only by one person one time a year. This name was used only one time of you by one person, one day of that year. And that was Yom Kippur, when the most high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies. He would first offer the blood sacrifice for himself first, Leviticus 16. Then for his family, and then for the rest of Israel, because Yahweh was the most holy name. The Lord is my shepherd. Now let's quickly move from his sovereignty to his sympathy. Or from his mastery. To his ministry. I invite your attention real briefly. To John chapter 10. Because the Jesus of the New Testament. Is the God of the Old Testament. And Jesus unlocked the door in John 10. Of the 23rd division of the book of Psalms. When Jesus stepped out in time in John chapter 10, when he stepped out in time and he says, I am the good shepherd. How interesting it is to observe. You know, all truth has a running parallel lines. And no one truth is going to contradict any other truth or it wouldn't be truth. So all truth has to run in parallel lines. You remember in that 40 chapter book called Exodus? You remember after the personal section of the first two chapters, God commissioned Moses in Exodus 3 to go down and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses asked the question, who shall I say that sent me? You know what's so interesting about that? God told him to tell him, I am. 
Holy, wait a minute. Well, Jesus is not a verb, is he? He's not an com incomplete sentence, is he? Why would you tell him, I am? We're dealing with the tetragrammaton here. I am of the New Testament. Whatever you want the Lord to be for you, all you got to do is just fill in the blank. I am, and this expression, the echo I me construction, I am, John 6, 39 beginning, 35 beginning, the bread of life. And John 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. John 8 and verse 24, if you don't believe that I am, the word he is not there, it's been added. You don't believe that I am. John 8 and verse 58, before Abraham was, I am. John 10 and verse 9, I am the door. John 11 and verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15 and verse 1, I am the true vine. No less than 40 times in the book of John, you're going to find this echo I me. Something that is intensified. No other like it. Whatever you want God to do for you. It's not an incomplete sentence. He's not a bird. You just fill in the blank. The Lord is my shepherd. Now three times real quickly. In scripture. Jesus Christ is depicted as shepherd. Now we see in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life or she. Quickly, if you were to turn to Hebrews 13 and verse 20, you know what you'll find. You will find Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. I am not only the good shepherd, but in in Hebrews 13 and verse 20, you will see him being called a shepherd again. It's so very interesting when we look at 1 Peter 5 and verse 4. The third time he's called shepherd. I am coming back for a crown. Jesus Christ being the good shepherd gave his life. Jesus Christ being the chief shepherd. He's coming back with a crown. Quickly. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know the secret to a life of satisfaction? You know the secret for a thirst of soul? Is to know the Lord as your shepherd. And then that endless supply. I shall not want. The little boy in Bible class. Vacation Bible school was trying to remember. This particular verse. And when he got up he says. The Lord is my shepherd. He's all I want. I'm the first one holiday man. He's all I want. Because when you have the Lord as your shepherd, he certainly supplies everything that we need. Oftentimes we're working, mowing the grass, working in the flower bed, in the garden, and we have created this insatiable thirst. And sometimes people make the mistake of trying to quench that thirst with a soft drink. 
They grabbed that Coca-Cola. <laughs> this might be some Coke back there. I, I don't know. But they grabbed that Coca-Cola, drank that Coca-Cola, and it never, ever quenches the thirst. I wonder why. At your own leisure, turn that Coke can around sometime. And read the ingredients. You know what it's going to say? All the fish are flavored. All the fish are sweetened. All the fish are colored. Those additives and ingredients was put in that Coke to keep you buying Coke and never to satisfy you. You're going to need the naked water. <clears throat> People all around me are trying to find what the heart yearns for. But they have said on their mind. But neighbor, I know the secret. I know where these are found. It's only in Jesus. True pleasures are blind. Jesus is all this world needs today. For men are blinded in their striving, they're lost, sin and they're dark in their way. But Lord, if you just pull back the grim curtain of night and take one look at Jesus and all will be right. Jesus, Jesus. All a person needs is Jesus. And when you have him, he satisfies. When you have Jesus Christ, you don't have all the self-esteem you need. So many times people think there is a place in all of our minds, in our spiritual lives, that nobody can truly satisfy but God Almighty. No husband, no wife, no girlfriend, no boyfriend, no any kind of friend. And if Jesus is not in his right place in our lives, we can go from day to day, from man to man, from woman to woman, because we're looking to somebody else to fulfill what only God can fulfill. How amazing it is when I look at the Bible. I see John the Baptist was single and satisfied. I see Timothy at the close of the scriptures was single and satisfied. I see Titus single and satisfied. Jeremiah 16, God forbid him to get a wife, single and satisfied. And above all, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was single and satisfied. Now it's okay if you're still looking and all that kind of thing, that's all right. But nobody can truly satisfy like God Almighty. You know, in today's world, we buy cars for status, don't we? Oh, yes, we do. But you know what? As soon as the newness wears off, it just seems as though that car stops satisfying. And you might be able to go out there in the parking lot on some of those cars and put a big sign on the windshield and say, Wash me. <laughs> because once we get accustomed, Things stop satisfying. <clears throat> Solomon said it best in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 10. He that think he's satisfied, he that has silver, will never be satisfied with silver. The only thing that can truly satisfy <clears throat> is God Almighty. Number one, we have to, just for a recapitulation, to learn and know God as the glorious sovereign. Secondly, we have to know God as the gentle shepherd. He's all that I need. He's God in heaven. We got a man on earth. And then thirdly, I shall not want. Thank you so much for listening.